Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Uh, you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, yeah, this evening I'll be talking about the Canary Islands. Um, so I'll be focusing on three of the islands, which are, funnily enough, the three that I visited. Um, so the first thing in any of these um, any of these topics to look at is uh, location. Um, so where are the Canary Islands? So you can see here a map of Europe and Africa and um, so the Canary Islands are located just off the west coast of Africa um, at the closest point uh, it's 62 miles off the coast of Morocco uh, but belongs to Spain so um, a lot of Spanish influence there the language main language is, is Spanish although with it being such a hot tourist destination um, English is, is fairly widely spoken, at least in the um, hospitality industry. Um, so from the overall map, this is um, then the Canaries in general. Um, so there are many islands in the archipelago in general, but there are seven main islands. Um, and we'll be visiting three of them. So Tenerife, um, which is the largest um, of the seven main islands. Um, and then over towards the right hand side, Fuerteventura, which is actually the second largest of these uh, seven islands. And then Lagomera, which is just to the left, just to the west of uh, Tenerife, uh, which is the sixth largest of these seven main islands. Um, so first off then Tenerife, um, so this talk is, is basically going to follow um, roughly the itinerary of the trip that I guided for Heather Lee um, in February this year. Um, so it's a, it's a trip that's split between the three islands, um, four nights on Tenerife, um, three nights on Fuerteventura, and then from Tenerife um, doing a, a day trip uh, by ferry to the island of Lagomera. Um, so this is the island of Tenerife. Um, it's dominated um, by Mount Tahiti in the centre, uh, which is a volcano. It's actually the fourth tallest volcano in the world. Uh, it's not currently, well, they, they don't currently say it's active, um, but they don't say it's dormant either. Um, they are currently saying that it could reactivate at any point. Um, so I'm just glad it wasn't while I was there. Um, but it's it's very much um, dominated by Tahiti in the centre. Um, and then you've got uh, an area of forest, uh, the next level down, pine forest. And then you've got laurel forest, next layer down. And then all around the coast, you've got your um, more touristy areas, uh, the beaches and so on. So it is very well known for being... Um, a tourist destination um, but uh, provides some fantastic birding and although mostly around the coast um, there are a lot of busy tourist uh, resorts you don't have to go too far before um, you don't really see that many people at all. Um, so while I was in Tenerife we stayed in the village of Villa Flor uh, which is just to the south of Tahiti, um, but I'd say sort of maybe halfway up in terms of elevation from sea level up to up to Tahiti. And that provides a good base. Uh, you're away from the main tourist areas, um, but you've still got good quality hotels and uh, you're in a good area for getting up to the mountains and also for visiting the other coastal areas and so on as well. So just round Villa Flor and just maybe slightly further up, um, you have these big pine forests. Um, so this is where um, you'll find the first of your main Canary Island species. Um, this is a picnic site actually just off the main road. Um, and um, it's surprisingly cool actually. Um, it was so it's February when I visited and generally speaking, the weather was warm-ish I would say um, but it definitely wasn't short sleeve weather I would say unless you were right right down at the coast 
um, once you start to climb a little bit, the uh, the temperature is much more um, uh, pleasant, shall we say, um, uh, certainly warmer than Scotland and probably North Wales, but um, not baking hot. Uh, so these sort of campsite, uh, sorry, these picnic areas um, attract plenty of birds like most picnic areas do. And here you'll find the first uh, special bird of the Canary Islands, uh, the uh, blue chaffinch, uh, which sort of size and shape really is is just like a chaffinch. It's just that it's blue. Nice RAF um, shade of blue, in my opinion. Um, there are actually two subspecies of this blue chaffinch. Uh, you find this one on the tenor on Tenerife, and then the other one is is Gran Canaria. There's not a huge amount of difference between them, but at the moment they are just subspecies. Um, but it's one of the key birds um, when you visit Tenerife, and um, it was nice to be able to find this one um, pretty quickly. Um, in terms of the more common birds uh, you'll find around, you do find standard woodland birds if you like so things like this great spotted woodpecker but a lot of them um as Nigel mentioned with um evolution it's it's an archipelago um and a lot of these species have been um out on these islands for so long that they have um developed into distinct subspecies so you get uh canary island subspecies of great spotted woodpecker of um standard common chaffinch um gold crest uh, and plenty of other species so they are recognizable um, but ever so slightly different so just as an example this greater spotted woodpecker um it you'll see underneath it's much more buff and that's not just because it's grubby um that's the uh distinguishing feature of this particular subspecies of great spotted woodpecker uh, much more creamy buff underneath rather than the the whiter that we're used to seeing um, this is uh, the Canary Islands Chiff Chaff, uh, which is actually a separate species. Um, and like most Chiff Chaffs uh, that we're used to seeing, they don't hold still for very long. Um, this was uh, the best shot I actually managed of it. And it, as a photographer, I'm sure some of you will sympathise. I find it very annoying that I couldn't get a shot without the pine needles in the way. But um, yeah. Canary Islands chiff chaff, ever so slightly different from the common chiff chaff. Um, it has shorter wings, making its tail look longer, and it does actually have a different song as well. Um, and you do also get much more of a, a Mediterranean sort of African feel in some of these species with the brighter colours, uh, like such as this Atlantic canary, um, which is only really found on, on some of these islands. Um, and then we come on to um, blue tits. So the blue tits that you find on uh, the Canary Islands are African blue tits, uh, but it's not quite so straightforward. Um, there are uh, actually seven different subspecies of African blue tit, and five of those are found on the Canary Islands. Almost every island has a different subspecies of African blue tit. Um, those of you who can do the maths pretty quickly will notice that not every island has its own because there's seven main islands and five subspecies. Um, but the Tenerife, for example, this is the Tenerife blue tit as it's commonly known at the moment. Um, whether this is going to be split out eventually um, remains to be seen. Um, essentially, it does look very similar to um, the European blue tit, but you may notice it's much darker around the face. Uh, the black lines are much thicker than they are on our blue tit, and the cap on top of the head is a much darker blue. Um, and even in some of the subspecies, it looks almost black. Um, but um, behavior is pretty much the same as, as whole blue tits, to be honest. Um, pretty standard hanging around picnic sites, cafes. Um, it's a good place to find them. So slightly lower than the pine forests that we've been at so far, um, you'll find the laurel forests and they do extend um, for quite a, a range around the, the middle of the island. Um, and 
I will touch on them briefly now just to say that there are laurel forests on um, Tenerife, uh, but I'm going to cover some of the species that we find there a bit more when we go on to um, Lagomera. So then climbing further up um, is Mount Teide. So you can see the summit of the mountain, of the volcano here. Um, and you'll see it's a vastly different landscape. Um, there is snow uh, on Teide uh, in the winter. Uh, when we were there, there was a little bit of snow. Um, you can't see it too much here. You can just see it a, a little bit around here, but actually on the, the uh, this is the southern slope, on the northern slope, as you might imagine, I guess it's uh, uh, where the sun doesn't reach quite the same. Uh, there was a little more... Um, settled snow um, and you can see that it was an active volcano uh, you can see the lava flows here um, so this black section coming down this shoulder is one of the lava flows and then all this section at the bottom here is all all lava and where those lava flows are it, there's very little life um, but there's certainly plenty to be seen um, outside of the lava flows but still within um, the crater area. Um, so this is one of the uh, endemic species to the Canary Islands, the Berthelot pipit. And as soon as you get to these sorts of areas, they're pretty much everywhere. Um, and it's almost the only pipit that you find. Um, and they are resident. Uh, so you'll see plenty of Berthelot pipits. Um, the only other pipit that you're really likely to find is tawny pipit, um, and they're quite actually easy to to identify um, from the Berthelot's pipit with having much um, cleaner breast um, here uh, than than the Berthelot's does. Um, also around. Um, Mainly around the road areas, to be honest, you'll find um, the uh, it was the southern grey shrike. I think uh, officially now it's it's just classed as a subspecies of, of great grey shrike, um, although it's not always easy to keep up with what they split out and what they lump together. Uh, but these birds are, are fairly common um, sitting up on uh, sticks like this one on top of bushes. Um, and uh, generally being fairly conspicuous. And then some more familiar birds that you'll find around there is plenty of ravens. Um, and uh, they're, as you'll know, the ravens that we have uh, here in the UK, they're pretty gregarious and it's not necessarily unusual to see sort of flock of six, seven, eight um, roaming around, um, picking up scraps in the visitor car parks. Um, as well as elsewhere around. So um, we'll move on to uh, Lagomera, so, uh, which is just to the west of Tenerife. And it's quite straightforward to, to get there. There is a, a ferry um, that goes between Tenerife and Lagomera. It's about an hour. Um, there are actually two ferries that go. Uh, there is a Fred Olsen ferry. Um, and then there is the sort of local um, Spanish company uh, which operate a ferry. Now um, the Fred Olsen is a catamaran and it always used to be that you'd go on the, the local ferry because it took a bit longer, it was a slower ferry um, and there was plenty of deck space where you could um, sea watch, you could look for sheer waters and petrols and so on uh, from the crossing. Um, since Covid um, they've actually got a new ferry for the so-called slower crossing. Um, and it now only takes just a couple of minutes longer than the Fred Olsen ferry and is also now a catamaran. And um, the bad news with that is that because of the speed it goes, they have much less outdoor space. Um, and in fact, you are not allowed outside at all, apart from one small smokers area at the back, which can comfortably probably fit about half a dozen people, but everyone wants to be outside and see the view. So it usually ends up pretty crammed and it can be a little more difficult these days uh, to actually get any decent bird watching. Uh, anyone that's been on any kind of ferry will know that bird watching from inside is never good. 
um, because the um, sea spray and salt and so on on the windows make viewing pretty much impossible. But although it was difficult, we did manage to um, do a bit of watching, a bit of sea watching um, from the crossing. Uh, this photo uh, is actually taken on the way back um, just as we were leaving La Gomera, um, because you can only get out of the back. So, um, but it just shows um, the port and the main town down the bottom. Um, and it's always worth a little wander around the port area. Um, we didn't find a huge amount of species. Um, it was pretty quiet in general, um, but even just for the views, um, and there was a peregrine uh, hanging around overhead. Um, but as soon as you look down as well as up, um, you'll find wildlife. Uh, so we found plenty of these um, red crabs uh, down on the shoreline. Um, and it was one of those sort of, as soon as you see one, you start to see all of them. And despite the fact that this is a very bright red colour, they actually uh, camouflage very well. Um, but um, yeah, it was quite fun watching these guys scuttling about um, in and amongst the rocks and the rock pools. So I mentioned the sea watching. Um, one of the main species that you'll find without too much of a problem off all the Canary Islands is Cory's shearwater. Uh, they're moving through the waters here in, in decent numbers. Um, and it only takes a couple of minutes of standing on the shore or from the back of the ferry. And you're likely to see um, several Cory shearwaters. And over the hour long crossing, um, we probably saw a couple of hundred um, Cory's. Um, it is also possible to see other species from the crossing. We didn't this particular time, but things like Barolo shearwater, little shearwater, and um, white-faced storm petrel are uh, the main species that you can hope to see um, from the ferry crossing. Um, I didn't manage it this time, but um, just an excuse to go again, really. Uh, so uh, you don't see too many um, other sort of seabirds um or coastal birds um but the main gulls that you'll find are yellow leg gull uh, that's pretty much the only gull you'll find um so you can um not worry too much about your um identification pretty much if you see a gull it's a yellow leg gull um which makes it a lot easier so once you've come off the ferry and you've had a look around the port area you need to climb inland um, and find yourself in the laurel forests and this is the the main thing that bird watchers are going to come and find when they visit Lagomera um, so you can see it's a stunning landscape um, driving is probably not for the faint-hearted um, it's um, very steep winding roads um, and um, yeah, it's but it's it's absolutely beautiful. And the more you climb, the better the view gets. So you're coming into these laurel forests. Um, you've got fantastic views of the scenery surrounding and right the way down to the sea. Uh, but you are hoping for um, specialist laurel forest species. Um, and you can't help but also find plenty of the European migrants um, as well. So things like black cap. Um, Canary Islands chiff chaff, uh, common chiff chaff, um, and then things like Sardinian warbler and a few other species like that as well. But what you're really hoping for uh, is pigeons. So there are two um, species of pigeon which are endemic to the Canary Islands. Um, they're both loosely clustered laurel pigeons uh, found within the laurel forests on um, Lagomera and Tenerife are the, the main places that you would go and look for them um, and say two species so there's laurel pigeon uh, which is also known as the white-tailed laurel pigeon and balls pigeon um, and um, they both look fairly similar um, slightly different colouring around the head um, uh, but uh, in flight is the best way to tell the difference different um, tail patterns mainly in flight um, so this is a, a bowls pigeon um, and uh, you can see the um, white sort of paler band 
towards the bottom end of the tail here, uh, which is one of your, your key uh, identifiers. Um, and again, when it's facing this way, you can see, again, um, paler band towards the bottom of the tail, but ultimately you have this darker terminal band. Um, the laurel pigeon, slightly different colour on the head and um, just a, a much more much plainer white tail. Um, sadly, uh, I didn't actually get any photos of the laurel pigeon, um, although we saw quite a few. Um, and it was one of those, both species, in fact, were, were those that, you know, we were looking and looking and looking and then suddenly we found some and then we kept seeing them. Mm -hmm. So we um, saw them every single day we were on Tenerife and Lagomera. Um, we saw both species. So um, we considered ourselves very fortunate, um, especially because you know, there was quite a lot of low cloud, um, sort of fog, mist drifting in and out uh, while we were on both Tenerife and Lagomera. Um, so other wildlife that you can find, um, and these applies to um, all the islands, to be honest, um, but particularly Tenerife and, and Lagomera, um, this might look like uh, brimstone. And it is a brimstone, but it's actually Canary Islands brimstone. And with a lot of things uh, on the Canary Islands, um, it'll either be a subspecies or a separate species. And it'll be named exactly what it is as the main species, but just with Canary Islands in front of it. So this is a Canary Islands brimstone. Um, and uh, speckled wood, uh, but again, Canary Islands speckled wood. Um, and sometimes you can't really tell much of a difference. Certainly, I'll just go back to the brimstone. Certainly with the brimstone, it just looked like a brimstone. Um, the speckled wood, the colouring was a little bit different. Um, it's a much richer colour, I think, um, but um, yeah, Canary Island speckled wood. And of course, um, with it being a, a warm environment, a hotter environment, um, you will find uh, lizards as well. Uh, so there are several species of, of lizard that you'll find out there. Um, this is Butker's lizard. Um, and uh, yeah, they, um, they're they very quick. This is a, a younger one. Uh, so it's really quite skinny and small, um, but we did see quite a few others and, you know, poking their heads out of crevices in rock walls um, was um, was one of the best places to find them. So then uh, moving uh, east, we're going to head to Fuerteventura. So this is the um, one of the closer islands to um, Africa. So you do see a difference in the environment, in the um, climate, um, the uh, vegetation. So the more western islands in the archipelago uh, do tend to be a lot more lush, a lot more heavily vegetated, green. Um, and then as you get towards Africa, they are much more um, desert landscapes. Um, and that's certainly very obvious. Um, on Fuerteventura. So this is uh, a very typical landscape on Fuerteventura. So very arid. Um, it's much hotter. I, well, certainly I found much hotter than, than Tenerife. Um, and so this is this is fairly typical. Um, you've got a, a dirt track here. Um, and then you'll find these areas of cultivation, um, which are heavily irrigated. Um, and uh, so we're locals growing their, their crops there. So there's a good road network on Fuerteventura. Um, most of the roads, the main roads are all tarmac, but it doesn't usually take you too long to get onto um, the dirt roads. Um, so this is um, one of the more famous areas um, on Fuerteventura, certainly in terms of birding anyway. Um, so this is Tindaya Plain. Um, and again, here you can see very arid, uh, little, small areas of, of green, uh, but very rocky. Uh, you've got the dirt road going through the middle. Uh, and you're looking for the specialist desert species, um, including uh, an endemic species. Um, but you'll find plenty of uh, species that you'll find in countries like Morocco and similar latitude across Africa. So things like trumpeter finch, uh, like this female, uh, and then the male. So these uh, you'll quite often found around those cultivated areas 
sort of in the midst of the desert, if you like, you can find uh, the trumpeter finches. Um, and um, I, the trumpeter, I guess its its name comes from the call, um, but I think it sounds a bit more like a kazoo than a trumpet, to be honest, like a sneezy kazoo. Um, but it's still pretty identifiable. And um, any thorn bush or fence post or gate post or anything, you, you're likely to find shrikes again. Um, Short-toed larks uh, do you like to feed in amongst the um, slightly vegetated areas. Um, that's pretty much the only lark species that you're going to get get out here. So again, that does make um, identification a lot easier. That's the one thing when you've, you're in a place where you get few species, it does at least make identification a lot easier. Um, Bertholot's pipit, again, pretty common out in these desert areas on Fuerteventura. You won't have to go far before you find Bertholot's pipit. Uh, and then look to the skies and you'll you'll find Egyptian vultures. Um, there's a big breeding program um, for the vultures on Fuerteventura. Uh, I don't know if it, any eagle-eyed can spot this or should it be vulture-eyed? Um, but you can see this one's ringed. Um, so there's been a big conservation effort. Um, in general, they're... Uh, they have been endangered. Um, there's a lot of conservation efforts underway in places like Spain. And so that kind of follows on, on Fuerteventura. So nest sites are closely monitored. Um, there are areas where they will feed them, uh, feeding stations, if you like. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, so far they, they seem to be responding well um, and are recovering. So there's, I would say there's three main species that you're going to want to look for um, in these desert areas sort of uh, I sort of refer to them as like the big three that you can only really find in these very limited um, desert areas on Fuerteventura so Tindaya Plain is one of the places you can find all three of these species the first one being cream coloured corsa um, which I think is a it's a very dapper looking bird um, with its little blue head and the, the black black and white stripe around its eye. Um, and we came across, across this pair um, that did seem to be displaying to each other. And, you know, um, I guess we're all adults. So one thing led to another. Um, and I guess before too long, there were more courses. Um, so, yeah, these are really bonny looking birds. Um, and uh, take a bit of finding, though, as you can you can see, they're pretty well camouflaged in amongst the rocks and so on. So um, they do take a bit of finding. Um, and next one after that would be um, black-bellied sand grouse. Um, now these, um, I, I really like these. I think they're, they're fabulous birds. Um, and in flight, they look absolutely spectacular with that black belly showing up. And they've got that lovely um, black line at the bottom of the throat. And they have a lovely bubbly call as well, um, which is often the first you know that they're flying overhead. Um, and it's it's a good idea to, to listen out for that call because it's a good clue that they're on the move. Because again, they're quite hard to find when they're on the deck. They're very well camouflaged. And you can see that black belly is almost invisible um, once they're, they're down on the deck. Um, but uh, they can be quite confiding if you do get if you do find them. Um, we were this was this one was taken in February this year, um, and uh, we, we were only maybe ten meters, five, eight, ten meters away from this bird, um, and there were, there were three or four uh, in and around this area. Um, in actual fact, we we look we were just driving through the plane, and we'd been driving for probably half an hour driving very slowly along these tracks, just scanning each side. Um, and um, as a guide, you do start to worry, if you like. You know, you've been driving for half an hour, everything looks the same. You're not really finding much. Um, and I just stopped uh, just in an area that looked good. Um, and... Uh, for no other reason than we'd not seen anything for half an hour. And I thought, well, might as well have a proper scan and see what we can find. 
Um, and I just stopped the bus and started scanning. And within a few minutes, we'd found these black billed sand grouse. We saw cream colored corsa. Um, and then we also saw the third bird, which is um, special filtered Tindaya plain, which is Hubara busted. Um, it's a species which is also found on on Af in Africa, um, although the ones you find on Fuerteventura are a separate subspecies. Um, but much bigger than either the corsa or the sand grouse. Um, but I would say possibly harder to find, much more elusive. Um, and considering their size, um, they are incredibly well camouflaged. Um, but again, we dropped very lucky with this bird, um, really close to the van. And we actually didn't see it first. We found the cream colored corsa, we found the sand grouse, and this thing was just stood there maybe Again, maybe about maybe 10 feet from the bus. Um, so just sort of five, six meters, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, you just suddenly see maybe a tiny fleck of movement. Um, and then this thing materializes almost like um, one of those magic eye pictures. Once you see it, you think, how on earth did I miss that? It's right under my nose. Um, and this bird clearly knew we were there. It was looking at us. But it didn't seem too fussed. Um, it gradually moved away. Um, but I, I should say that um, at no point when we were watching these birds on today's plane did we get out of the vehicle. Um, that's one of the things that they they do advise uh, when you're out there: do not get out of your vehicle to watch these birds because they are um, very prone to disturbance. And um, so, yeah, we were watching from the bus. Um, I say knew we were there. Uh, just carried on feeding, eventually moving, generally moving away from us, but not really that fussed. So yeah, we'd been out there for a while and then suddenly we'd had all three target species um, on these planes within within a few, within five minutes. So aside from the, the planes themselves, um, you'll also um, want to visit the Barrancos. So Barranco, um, is a term used for a narrow, narrowish, winding river gorge. Um, and you'll find a lot of them uh, dotted throughout Fuerteventura um, because ultimately they are river gorges. They tend to be more vegetated. Uh, so you can see here, there's some palm trees and a few, um, a few other bushes knocking around. Um, although for the majority, vast majority of the year, they are completely dry um they still uh, hold up a little bit more life and you can get a bit more variety there um so you'll find birds like um spectacled warbler uh initially given away by its call probably the easiest way to find them um and then um you can usually observe them quite well um without getting too close um we found a, a couple of pairs in one of the barrancos and we were able to just watch them from, from a good distance um, uh, for quite a while. So we're going backwards and forwards, clearly um, nesting somewhere close by. Um, and you'll also find things like subalpine warbler. Um, and uh, the one of the other endemic species that you find out here, this one limited just to Fuerteventura. Um, it was at one point known as Fuerteventura chat. Uh, and it's it's now known as Canary Island Stone Chat, um, but it is um, it's pretty much only found on Fuerteventura, so um, I'm not entirely sure why they they changed it from Fuerteventura Chat to Canary Island Stone Chat. But it looks like a stone chat. Um, it's just a little paler maybe um, than our stone chats. It's not quite got the the colour on the breast um, that our stone chat does, but in essentially it behaves exactly the same um so you'll find it sitting up on top of bushes um and it might fly down but it'll usually reappear on another perch not too far away um so they can be quite uh, quite easy to to find although before um we were everyone was joining i was chatting to 
Nigel and Stephen, I was saying the first time I went to Fuerteventura, I was there just on the one island for a whole week and we spent all week uh, looking for Fuerteventura charts as it was then and didn't find any until the second to last day. Um, but this time when I was there uh, earlier this year, I was only there for the three nights and um, we had them the first after afternoon we were on the island and we saw them everywhere. But um, that's just the wonders of birding, I guess. Um, sometimes you'll fall over things and others then sometimes it's a bit harder to find things. Uh, so other species that you can find, woodchat shrike, um, and it's a, a nice opportunity to see a bird like this uh, in its proper plumage. I say proper plumage, that's maybe unfair of me, um, but I know most of the ones that we find, we see in the UK are um, juvenile birds, um, and so uh, not quite in the, the stunning plumage that this one is. Um, so I mentioned before that it's it's a very arid climate, so you do well to find water on Fuerteventura. But where you do find it, um, it's definitely worth going to because you're always going to find a good array of species. Uh, so this is actually a reservoir, Los Molinos Reservoir. Um, and um, it, there's usually not a lot actually on the surface in terms of, of ducks. Um, you don't really have that many duck species um, out on Fuerteventura. Um, but it's pretty good for waders around the edges. So you'll find th things like um, black winged stilts um, and uh, a lot of other um, migrant waders. So things like uh, green shank, uh, wood sandpiper, um, common sandpiper, uh, and uh, some egret type species as well. So um, in terms of actually ducks, we did find this one this year um which um we looked at for a while in the scope um but this is actually a phone scoped picture it was a bit too far away from my camera um and we were looking at it um we realized pretty quickly it was a scope uh and then partly with process of elimination thinking about where we were off the west coast of africa it was much more likely to be a lesser scope than a greater scope um and then Looking at it a little more closely, we decided, yes, it was definitely a lesser scorp. And it was only then when I got back to the hotel in the evening, I checked eBird um, and saw that actually there'd been a lesser scorp reported all winter on Los Molinos Reservoir. Um, but still, it was interesting to have the uh, identification um, debate and discussion with the group and come to the conclusion and then find out that we were definitely right. So it's always good when you're right. Um, other waterfowl um, you can find um, ruddy shell duck. There are an awful lot of them out on Fuerteventura, um, mainly around places like Los Molinos. Um, this this one actually wasn't at Los Molinos. This particular photo was taken um, near a flooded quarry, um, but um, they're they're pretty common out there. And I mentioned some of the egret type birds, um, so spoonbills. If you get if there are spoonbills on the island, then places like Los Molinos um, is the best place to find them. And then common sandpiper as well. So um, other more vegetated areas are always worth visiting and always tend to be around the villages. Um, so any urban area um, will have a lot more vegetation than than sort of the more rural areas. Um, because people are cultivating crops, gardens, um, and are bringing in water. Um, so it's a good place to find things like Spanish sparrow, um, and also things like hoopoe, uh, which aren't actually all that common out there. Um, I think this, this photo was taken the first time I went out there before COVID. Um, this year, um, as far as sort of the group goes, we didn't see hoopoe. Um, I saw one briefly in flight um, as we were driving along. Um, but so they're on Fuerteventura, but just not all that common. And it's a good um, what place to see things like white wagtail, the uh, nominate race for our pied wagtail. And then this rather bedraggled looking thing 
is uh, African blue tit, but the subspecies that you find on Fuerteventura, um, rather than the subspecies that you find uh, on Tenerife. Uh, this one, uh, as you can see, this irrigation pipe there, uh, and it was taking a bath, hence why it looks rather bedraggled. Um, and um, you'll probably have to just take my word for it, really, but you can see that the cap is a lot darker, almost black, uh, and it's not just because it's wet, it actually is uh, much blacker uh, than the uh, Tenerife subspecies, um, and then obviously much, much darker than, than our European blue tip. Kestrels are quite common, uh, especially around the, the urban areas. This one appeared to be nesting in the top of this uh, dead palm tree. But it's always worth remembering that it is a tourist place. Uh, there are a lot of resorts around the coast of Fuerteventura, but they are also good places to find birds as well. So, yes, it's nice to go um, out into the plains um, to find birds, but also if you want to have a bit of uh, downtime, um, you can do so around the resorts and the hotels um, whilst and also see plenty of birds. So I know um, there's quite a few people um, who's who will be uh, on family holidays um, and uh, wanting to get a bit of birding in. And this is definitely a good way of being able to to do that whilst um, still getting in your family holiday. So you built up areas. Um, we found these um Hadada ibis, um, which um, I've never quite been able to work out whether they were really wild or whether they were introduced. Um, I've seen um, reports of them being of of both, so I'm I'm not in, I'm still not entirely sure on the status of these birds, um, but whatever they were, very nice to see. Um, and you'll get monk parakeets, which are now wild, but obviously originally introduced, um, but you can find them quite a bit around um, the uh, built up areas um, and they nest in noisy colonies. And again, plenty of Spanish sparrows around. Um, there's no house sparrows really out there. So you see a sparrow, it's, it's a Spanish sparrow. And you can chill up at, uh, at the beach. So this, we were actually uh, having a coffee break in one of the uh, cafes right on the uh, one of the resorts in, on Fuerteventura um, and you can see one of the chairs sat at the table and there were these turnstones just running up and down this wall very confiding uh, this photo was taken on my phone um, so no big camera needed um, and no effort needed to be honest um, and then just down from there there were things like ringed plover little ring plover, uh, plenty of um, common sandpiper um, and you can't really go too far in the tourist areas uh, without finding um, these gorgeous little ground squirrels and they are I guess probably considered a nuisance by the locals uh, but um, they're very cute um, and it's really hard to resist them um, and they are pretty confiding as well, especially around tourist areas. Um, they're very much um, trouble, no doubt, um, very cheeky. And given half the chance, they'll steal your sandwiches, um, but um, very endearing. Um, so I hope that's given you a bit of an idea um, of what you can expect from, from the islands. Um, I guess it wouldn't be much without giving a bit of a plug. Um, I am, after all, a working guide. And the more work I get, the better for me and the better for everyone. There's nothing I like better than showing people birds. So um, this uh, Canary Islands trip that I ran this year, it's not running in 2024, but it is running in 2025. Um, so as I say, it's, um, it's a, it's a week-long trip, four nights on Tenerife, three nights on Fuerteventura, uh, with a day trip to... Lagomera. Um, you don't see a huge number of species, um, but uh, there are plenty, plenty of things to see and lots that you don't get anywhere else in Europe. Um, and it's always nice to get a bit of winter sun. Um, so please uh, visit the Heatherly website if you're interested. 
um, which is heatherly.co.uk. Um, and, you know, I probably should just mention a few other things that we've got going on as well. Um, if, um, if Spain takes your fancy, you do fancy a bit of winter sun, um, we have some spaces on trips for uh, Lynx in uh, Doniana, down at the south end of Spain, uh, which is in January, um, and Catalonia, um, which is April, so that's northeastern Spain. Um, so those have both got spaces on. And um, our bread and butter for Heatherly is Scotland, the Highlands. Uh, we've got plenty of um, different itineraries and trips to offer uh, in the Highlands and Islands um and some really good offers actually on tours at the beginning of next year uh, there's a good range of tours available at 995 pounds per person no single supplement um so if you're interested at all please have a look at the website get in touch with the office um and i am now available for any questions that you have whether it's about what i've talked about or anything else Great. Thank you very much, Holly. And we don't mind at all you giving a plug for Heatherly. Uh, <laughs> great, very good value and a great variety of holidays on offer there. Thank you. And I'm sure you've certainly whetted everyone's appetite for the Canary Islands. Thank you. It was a super talk. Um, and I know you, you've kindly said <clears throat> you'll answer some questions. I hope uh, the audience out there have got a few for you. I'll just um, make a first question whilst people are um, getting their questions together. And I, could I just ask in general what what the um, protection what protection status is accorded to uh, to the birds and the habitats that are of limited extent in the Canary Islands? Yeah, so I um, it's it's not something that I can maybe answer definitively. Um, basically, from my own observations. Um, a lot of the uh, laurel forest habitat is protected. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is sort of park area. Um, so it's um, almost government um, funded, government look um, maintained. Um, so there's a lot of park areas like that, which do remain protected. Um, I guess with a lot of places, sort of European African places, hunting can be a problem. Um, but a lot is done by um, the locals to try and protect uh, what they've got. They know it brings in the tourism. Um, and although this is going to probably sound like more of a shame, shameless plug, um, the more we go on bird watching trips to places like this, um, the more these things will get protected because it's seen as worthwhile and brings in the money. Um, uh, the ecotourism uh, is always good. One of the best tools we've got, I think, uh, in terms of conservation, uh, almost voting with our feet. Um, so I certainly didn't see any evidence of um, anything other than conservation efforts um, while I was out there. Uh, you don't get many local birders, certainly um, as in, when I say local birders, I mean as in original Canary Island uh, local birders, you'll find a lot of expats, um, expat birders. I think that's what probably what most of the local birders are out there now they're expats um but um yeah there's certainly a lot of conservation effort underway well that, that's good good to hear thank you holly any questions out there holly um I'm, i noticed on your uh, photograph of the spoonbill uh, it had some rings on it did, <laughs> did you manage to read them at all to get close no. enough no all right okay no i knew someone would spot that um, all right okay yeah because i i did only when i was editing the photos i i spotted it um but no it's it was too far away to to be able to read anything on i, I mean the, the only reason i was asking was um God, i don't know it was probably about 10 15 years ago we had, we had a bird in north wales that i think it ar arrived on the ship or something it was from mauritania because apparently <laughs> Apparently, Mauritania have a their own endemic subspecies of spoonbill, um, oh. which and and I mean that's the thing with the Canary Islands is you forget even though it's Spanish, it's it's quite a way down. It's it's you know it's more like Africa really, isn't it? Sort of yeah. you know an African island. So and you you do see that in the in the wildlife. Yeah. 
Um, I, I loved your photograph of the uh, the cream coloured corsairs because I forget they've got a black underwing, which is you know I mean, they're cooler cool anyway. But that's uh, I think that makes them even cooler. So yeah, well, well, thank you very much for a great talk. Thanks. You're very yeah. welcome. Thanks, Steve. Any more questions? Can I ask Holly, uh, what's the incidence of American um, vagrants or migrants on the Canary Islands? Having um, seen so many in Britain this autumn, I wonder if the same effect was felt on, on the Canaries. Do you know what? I actually don't know. Um, I know we, we saw the, the lesser score, which is, which is mm. an American vagrant. Um, and I know they get things like American Widgeon on mm. occasion as well. Um, but I honestly don't know whether they had the same um, influx of the American um, vagrants that we did. I know we had a spectacular autumn from that perspective. Uh, and I, I'm honestly not that sure what it was like down there. Um, but um, I mean, and the one, actually, you just reminded me, the one species that I didn't mention at all, uh, which is not an American vagrant, but I just know that you sometimes get them over that way. It was red-billed tropic bird. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's a species which has started to um, colonize uh, the Canary Islands, Fuerteventura particularly. Um, and they do have a couple of pairs breeding out there now. Um, and I failed to see it both times. Um, the first time we went up towards the breeding area and we didn't see them. Um, and then this year, um, there'd been one that was hanging around, funnily enough, it was hanging around a shopping centre in um, Caleta de Fusti, one of the, the main tourist areas. And there's, there's this big shopping centre, and then there's this sort of ornamental pool. Um, and it seems that it's spending its day out at sea, and then it was coming to this particular pool at this shopping centre to bathe every evening, every afternoon. And I think, yes, we were there three nights each night, each afternoon we went to this shopping centre, to this pool, and spent about half an hour, 40 minutes, stood around this pool, hoping it was going to come in, and we missed it every time. Um, although the same, when we were there, I saw some fabulous videos on YouTube um, of it coming into this pool, but um, that's one of the species that's, you know, is showing a bit of a change in breeding patterns in that it's, it's now fairly recently i think um i've got 2016 in my head i'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. absolutely gospel but um it's not that long that it's been breeding out there um and it's yeah one to see next time maybe yeah well i hope you do i hadn't heard about that Shoot, is that the first breeding record for the paleoarctic or do they breed anywhere else on the east side of the atlantic i'm not sure that they do i think that's probably about the only that's probably the only place. No, no, that's really very interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? In the chat, we've got Julian saying that the spoon bill was in 1998, Steve, and time flies. Thank you. And Roberta says, thank you, Holly, for such an interesting tour of some of the Canary Islands. Best wishes for Christmas. Thank oh, you. and we've got a pair or two tropic birds, Lanzarote from John. Oh, thanks, John. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Pair or two, sorry. Tropic birds. Holly, there probably wasn't time in your talk to mention vocalizations by by birds. Did you really notice quite a difference from British birds' calls? You know, things like blue tits, blackbirds, and stuff like that. Uh, yes. Mm. You know, the, the most noticeable was actually the gold crest. Mm. So there's a, a subspecies of goldcrest, uh, funnily enough, it's known as the Canary Islands goldcrest. Um, and I heard this particular call and I was trying to find this damn bird. Um, and I thought it sounded like a coltit. Uh, coltit is obviously something that I see quite a lot here. Um, and it, it really did sound like a coltit, but there's no coltits out there. Mm. Um, so I ended up following this thing for, for a while and it was a gold crest, but it did sound like um, a coltit. Sorry, my dog's just come. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it sounded much more like a coltit call to me than, than a gold crest, but it, it was markedly different. Um, Chiff Chaff uh, 
is at least a separate species um, and has a different call, uh, but not so different that you wouldn't know it was a chiff chaff. Hmm. Um, and then even things like the um, the blue tits, uh, sorry, the uh, chaffinch. So actually since the trip in February, um, so, the, uh, so as far as common chaffinch goes, uh, it was a subspecies. There was a subspecies of Canary Islands chaffinch um, on the islands. And since I was there in February, it has actually been upgraded to a full separate species. So that was a nice armchair tick for me um, when they'd made that split this summer. And that call is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, the song is fairly similar, um, but it's much more of a, I thought it sounded a bit more like a house sparrow than, than a chaffinch. Um, so yeah, it's, it is very noticeable. I mean, things like black caps and so on um, are pretty much the same. Um, but yeah, in other things, it is very noticeable. Thanks, Holly. Thank you. Are there any more final questions for Holly before we close tonight? No? Well, it's my pleasant duty to thank you, Holly, on behalf of everybody out there who's listened and enjoyed your talk tonight. It was wonderful. It took me back, um, <laughs> having been to the islands a few times with students. Um, and I, I'm, I'm reminded how much we got out of it, like you got out of it. Um, I'm so glad that you explained not only the obvious differences and highlights, but also the subtle ones. Um, and you did it in, a, in a, a very gentle, easygoing way, which was very pleasant to listen to. And of course, very well complemented by those lovely pictures, not just of the birds themselves, but of the landscapes that they inhabit. And that all makes for a good talk. I particularly liked your uh, set of, um, of, of Puerto Ventura um, highlights. They were wonderful. Uh, those cryptic species, um, the, the busted um, and uh, the sand grouse and the corsa. Yeah, they don't get much better than that. And that very delicate um, chat. Uh, they were super pictures and you described the way in which you saw them uh, in a very endearing and exciting way it really makes me want to get up and go out and see them straight away and so thank you very much for that and for giving us some background into the conservation of the birds out there and their, their status at the moment and as i indicated at the beginning um telling us a little bit about the, the sort of subtle evolution that's going on between the islands and between the islands and north africa and the rest of europe is just fascinating um, it is a, a living laboratory for evolution. There's no doubt about it, if you care to look hard enough, uh, and you did that. So thanks for an eye-opening talk. Um, and I hope that as many people as possible will take advantage of visiting Canary Islands with you, or indeed other places on your list. If there are any like as, as good as the one you've just described tonight, then... They should be on everybody's uh, bucket list of tours to take. And it's very good of you to join us this evening. I know you're heading off to the Gambia at the weekend and you've not long been back from another <laughs> venue. So you squeeze us in um, very ha happily for us. And I hope not too much pre extra pressure for you. Um, and I think it's about time we let you get back to your dog and other aspects of family life and prep for that next trip. It's been a wonderful evening. And uh, all the best with your excursions over the winter. Thank you. <laughs>